a major part of any ancient science, was mathematics. It's difficult to tell how mathematics were used by the different Bronze Age cultures, as math could have just been done mentally, leaving no proof or procedure. This means the only evidence for math we can find, are from civilizations with writing systems. The two most prominent are from Mesopotamia and Egypt. Mesopotamians used a system based on the number 60, called the sexagesimal system. They used this mainly for multiplication and division. The beginnings of written math began with the beginnings of writing in Sumer, around 3200 BCE, although there is evidence of smaller scale accounting devices being used before cuneiform. Once writing developed, it was usually used to record administrative transactions and the movement of goods and their quantities. To track this, Sumerians developed different notations dependent on the goods. There was a symbol to record the number of sheep, a different one for an amount of grain. Writing evolved over the next thousand years, and by 2000 BCE, during the Neo-Sumerian Empire, a standardized system was in place all over the kingdom, which spanned Mesopotamia. This continued into the Old Babylonian period. Scribes wrote these notations on damp clay, using a dried reed, a system called cuneiform, meaning wedge-shaped. At the basis of the sexagesimal system were two symbols. The first was a vertical wedge, meaning the number one, and the other was a corner wedge, meaning ten. For numbers in between, scribes would just use multiple vertical wedges. For numbers between 10 and 59, they would use both the corner and vertical wedges. The number 60 resembled a 1, and was placed to the left in the sexagesimal position. Here's a quick example. What number would this be? Here is just one way to read it. Starting from the symbols to the right, we have three line wedges, meaning the number three. Beside that, are four corner wedges, each worth 10, giving us 40. So we will add 43 here. To the left of this is the sexagesimal place, meaning this number is over 60. On this side, we have three corner wedges and three line wedges. The corner ones are worth 10, so that's 30, plus the 3, makes 33. So this sexagesimal number is 3343. Next, is to multiply the sexagesimal number by 60. Instead of doing 33 by 60, we can more easily calculate 30 times 60 and then add 3 times 60. This gives us 1800, plus 180, or 1980 total. Add this number to the one on the right, 43, and we get 2023, the year this video was made. We make it more simple by placing a comma. The sexagesimal system was most likely adopted, because 60 is the smallest number that is divisible by every number from 1 to 6. We still use the base 60 system for counting minutes and seconds, as well as our calculations of angles. The best documented period for Mesopotamian mathematics was during the Old Babylonian Empire, the mid-2nd millennium BCE. Scribes would first learn the signs used to write in both Sumerian and Akkadian, and then went on to memorize the units of measurements, like weights and lengths. They would then learn multiplication tables for the sexagesimal system. But more advanced students would take math involving word problems. By the Babylonian period, mathematics had expanded to have problems about all sorts of topics. Procedure texts are often set up with the teacher stating, I have done this or that, and then, you, the student, must perform this or that, with a step-by-step -step guide on how to complete the problem using the given data. Tablets YBC 4666, 7164, are all written in Sumerian, and deal with problems involving the digging of canals. Other tablets about similar topics, were written in Akkadian. Some of these problems start off quite simple, but quickly become more complicated. Tablets were recovered that show a vast knowledge of quadratic equations, cubic equations, and the use of the Pythagorean theorem, 
over a thousand years before the Euclidean school or Pythagoras was even born. Metrology is the science of weights and measures, and these systems vary in different societies. It is important to remember that specific units also vary between regions and time periods. It wasn't until the Akkadian Empire that a standardized metrology was brought to Mesopotamia. The royal Gur cube of Akkad was a theoretical cube of water, from which all other units could be derived. It continued to be used by the Neo-Sumerians, Babylonians, Assyrians, and Persians. In America, the inch, foot, yard, and mile are used to measure length or distance. The ancient Mesopotamians had their own system for length, area, volume, and mass. For length, the cubit, or kush, was the basic unit and measured around half a meter, or 20 inches. On the shorter side, we have the grain, or shea. You need 180 grain to reach a cubit. But at the other end, you have the cord, which is 120 cubits long. These were used for construction and field divisions. For area, the basic unit was a garden, or sar, measuring about 12 by 12 kush. A burr, or estate, is a large unit of area, of 1800 gardens. Volume units were used to measure dry capacities, like for grain, or wet ones, like beer. The bowl, or sealer, was the basic unit, and measured around a liter. Sixty of these made a bariga, and 300 sealer was a gur, the capacity of the gur cube. The basic unit of mass was the shekel, or gin, measuring around 500 grams, while one mana is 60 gin. We can see relative sizes from these Babylonian weights. The largest weighs one mana, while the smallest is three shekels. In Egypt, mathematics was mostly done by scribes on papyrus. Unlike the mathematical tablets in Mesopotamia, papyrus was less able to survive long term. This gives us only a few Egyptian mathematical documents, most dated to the Middle Kingdom, which thrived around the same time as the old Babylonian Empire. But we know Egyptian math existed prior to this, as far back as their writing system developed. Like in Mesopotamia, the writing and number system was developed early on for administrative purposes. This occurred in Egypt by the First Dynasty, as evidenced by the Nama Mace Head. Nama was the king from Upper Egypt who brought together the tribes of his region and conquered Lower Egypt, unifying it. At the bottom of the Mace Head, we see a depiction of King Nama, with his flail. He is being presented with a number of tribute. There is a certain number of cattle, goats, and captives, a number represented by symbols. The Egyptian number system was done in multiples of 10. The number one was this sign, a single stroke. The number 10 was this curved symbol, most likely a cattle hobble. 100 was represented as a coil of rope. 1000 was the water lily, or lotus. 10,000 was the bent finger, and 100,000 was the tadpole. The largest was 1 million, represented by the god He, a god of the Ogdoad and personification of eternity, or infinity. For numbers in between, they would just repeat the same symbols. For example, to again write 2023, you would use two water lilies, two cattle hobbles, and three strokes. From what we know, what would this number be? Starting from the left, we find the god hair, three tadpoles, three bent fingers, three water lilies, three rope coils, and three hobbles. First, translate the symbols into their numerical values, then count how many of those symbols there are. In this case, apart from hair, there are three of each. This gives us a value of 1 million for the god, 300,000 for the tadpoles, 30,000 for the fingers, 3,000 for the lilies, 300 for the rope coil, and 30 for the hobbles. This system is additive, so the symbols can appear in any order. We still haven't uncovered any sources from the Old Kingdom, which began with the Third Dynasty, but we know mathematics must have been paramount for the administration of the unified Egyptian kingdom. The building of the pyramids, must have utilized an advanced knowledge of mathematics, 
both for the actual construction and the administration of the workforces used. As stated earlier, the Middle Kingdom provides us with the best examples of written Egyptian math. These are written in hieratic, the cursive script the Egyptians used for their hieroglyphics. One of the most famous is the rhymed mathematical papyrus. It was written in Thebes by the scribe Armes during the Second Intermediate Period, but was most likely based on an earlier document from the Middle Kingdom. It was named after Alexander Henry Rhind, a Scottish antiquarian who bought it. The papyrus, at 60 pages long, contains fractional tables and mathematical problems with their solutions. One of the tables included was the 2 over n table, used to convert fractions into the Egyptian format. The table lists many of these conversions, like 2 parts out of 3, is the equivalent to 1 half plus 1 sixth. There are solutions for the odd numbers, until 101. After the tables, are lists of problems related to various administrative procedures. Instead of unnecessarily distant scenarios, which are so frequent in today's textbooks, the ancient Egyptians used more practical problems which could be applied to the real world, like distribution of rations, granary sizes, the slopes of pyramids, and work rates. The other major mathematical text from Egypt is kept in Russia and is called the Moscow Mathematical Papyrus. While smaller than the Rhine Papyrus, the Moscow Papyrus is older. It is a collection of 25 problems, a plurality of which deal with pefsu. A pefsu measures the strength of beer made from a hecate, or unit of grain. So in essence, these were early algebraic calculations. There are also several geometry problems, including finding the volume of a truncated pyramid. Other papyri were also found, but most are only fragments. The Berlin papyrus is only two problems long, but seems to suggest the Egyptians knew the Pythagorean theorem. Rind also bought the Egyptian mathematical leather roll, or EMLR, which included another fraction table. The Lahan mathematical papyri are a collection of different texts, from administrative, veterinarian, and medical fields, but also came with mathematical fragments, which included the 2 over n table. Mathematics still remained important in the New Kingdom, but few texts have been found. The Papyrus Anastasi I, named after Giovanni Anastasi, who bought it in 1839, is a satirical text used to train scribes. Hori, an army scribe, writes to a fellow scribe, Amenemope, ridiculing him. A piece of the text has several math problems. The other fragmentary sources we have from this period that deal with math, focus more on administration, like the quarrying of a tomb or recording the harvest, so do not delve into techniques or procedure.